I want you to go to the book of Romans tonight. Romans chapter 11. Tonight, I want to, uh, I want to speak on this chapter because I believe that Romans chapter 11 is probably one of the most uh, misunderstood chapters in the Bible. There are uh, many statements that we're, that we're going to see in here that people have taken individual statements and you know they, they, they're not using the whole chapter. They're taking sentences that are in here and they're attaching meanings to them that just aren't taught in the Bible. And it's caused a lot of great error. And a lot of these statements that we're going to see, they've been, it's been pounded in our heads so much for so long that this is what these things mean that people, I mean, they, they bought into it. And it's just, it's settled. This is not an argument, but I'm going to show you what the Bible teaches about Romans chapter 11. And it is my, it is my hope that after you hear this tonight, that you will get Romans chapter 11. And so let's go ahead and try to uh, start reading right there in verse 1. And it says, I say then, hath God cast away His people? God forbid. And that's talking specifically about Israel. That's ca- talking about physical Israel, I believe. It says, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away His people, which He foreknew. What ye not what the Scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time, there also is a remnant according to the election of grace. Right here, what we see in these first verses here, most people read the first two verses, or really, uh, and they just, you know, God casts away his people. And then, no, obviously not. God forbid. God's not done with Israel. But what they forget to do is they forget to read the rest of the passage and get what he's fully talking about here. And he's basically saying, listen, folks, God has not cast them away. In other words, they can be saved. Israel is not reprobate. Jews are not reprobate. They could be saved. And most, the other problem we're going to see as we go through here, most people take all these verses and they make them prophetic future things. And I'm going to show you why they do that. It's, it's understandable why they do that. But I'm going to show you Romans 11 is all fulfilled. Okay? And if you're familiar with this chapter, you're going to think, whoa, wait, where are you going? I'm going to show you. It's all been fulfilled. But right here, this part where he says, God hath not cast them away. This isn't because God has a future plan for him. It's because right now, even so then, at this present time, okay, Paul's talking about during his time, God has not done. Proof of that was Paul was an, was an Israelite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and God saved him. So this passage clearly is not a prophetic passage of something in the future, but it was clearly referring to that present time. He said that at this present time. There, there is a remnant. Not all Jews or physical descendants of Israel are lost. There are some who are saved. Okay, they're out there. Okay, now around here we don't have a lot of Jews around here. Uh, you know, brother Mark, remember we met Bernie Sanders here, that Bernie Sanders guy here in town that one day. This guy looked like Bernie Sanders. He talked like Bernie Sanders, and he was a Messianic Jew, and you know he believed in Yeshua. You know he sounded just like Bernie Sanders when he talked. He was he was pretty funny. I don't think that guy was saved though. Uh, but you know what? He could be saved. He could be saved, and he. Uh, but you know, they're, they're, you know, we don't have a whole lot of them. But at the same time, you know, if we find them. We're not going to look at them as reprobate. God hasn't cast them away. They could be saved. And we're going to prove more verses on that here in a little bit. Verse 6, it says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it, to, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he, he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, we're not going to focus on this verse yet, but we're going to come back to it. It says, the election hath obtained it, what they were seeking for, which was salvation, okay? Most of them didn't get it, but some did. The election did. Those who believe got it, but the rest were blinded, okay? Blinded to where they could not get saved? Absolutely not. I'll show you that in a little bit. We'll we'll come back to verse 7. But verse 8 says, according as it is written, 
God had given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And we're not going to take time to read it, but that he is quoting Isaiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 11. And you need it. one of the reasons that people look at this passage as being future is there is some wording in here that is futuristic, but that's because it's quoting, it's using Old Testament scripture, which when the Old Testament was written, it was future. And Isaiah chapter 29, when it was written, it was talking about something in the future. But this time had already come. And so Isaiah 29, if you want to read that, verses 10 and 11 is what that's referring to. Verse 9 says, And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. That, turn over to Psalms chapter 69. Uh, we preached about this passage a while back. Psalms chapter 69. This also, you know, what he's quoting there is future, but it was not at this time. It was future back when David wrote it. But this has already happened. It's already been fulfilled. We make a, a, one of the biggest mistakes people make when the Bible is quoting Old Testament scriptures. They don't go back and look at those scriptures to see what it's talking about. If you would do that in your Bible study, it would help you greatly. But verse 21 says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. We know who that's talking about. It's talking about Jesus. Let their table become a, uh, let their table become a snare before them, and that which have been for their welfare. Let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thy indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. Okay? When you read this passage here in Psalm 69 where David that David is referring to, it is very harsh words against Israel, isn't it? It is very harsh words. And so he's referred to that. He's like, you know, they've... Uh, he quotes what David said, you know, let their eyes be darkened. He mentioned in verse seven about you know, them being blinded. And so it would be understandable when you read Psalm 69. And when you saw what the Jews were doing during that time, they rejected Christ. They killed Christ. They were persecuting the church. It would be understandable that some might think that these people are reprobate. They're done for. God is done with them. But look at what he says in verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. This also is a present reference. Okay, this isn't something that's going to happen in the future. Some people, I've heard some people say that, you know, when Jesus Christ returns and raptures the church, you know, they're all going to realize Jesus was the Messiah and they're going to be jealous because he's taken us and then they're going to call on him. No, this has already happened. Okay, God was doing a work with the Gentiles and Israel was supposed to see that the way God was using them. He'd given them his Holy Spirit and they were supposed to provoke them to jealousy so they would receive Christ. But it says, now if the fall of them be the riches of this world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness how much more their fullness? The title of my message tonight is the fullness of the Gentiles. But here's where we see the word fullness used the first time, which means their completion. Okay? Their completion. The Jews' rejection of the gospel and the persecution of the church is what caused the Christians to spread out throughout the earth. Okay? The finishing of them, the completion of them, it was a blessing to the world, okay? But they're not reprobate. You could see where people would have thought that from reading what it says there in Psalms chapter 69 with what they were doing. But that, listen, God still will save them. And there's a reason for that. God is, God is not done with them, okay? And look at what it says in verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, 
what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Notice in verse 2, it says, as God cast away Israel, God forbid. But here in verse 15, it says, for if the casting away of them. Now, what's going on here? Do we have a contradiction here in this chapter? Are they cast away? Are they not cast away? Well, obviously, they're not they're not cast away, but it sure does appear that way. See, and, and what's happened, why it seems like it's a contradiction, Paul is showing that their time is complete. Okay, The fullness of, the, of Israel, the fullness of time for them, it has been completed, but he's saying, yes, God has done in his dealings with Israel as it had been in the past, but he's not done in the sense that they can't be saved. That's what he's saying right here. Okay, The fullness of the Jews had come in, bringing in the time of the Gentiles. We'll cover more of that in a minute. But God will still save them. That's what he's, that's what he's teaching here. God will still save Israel. He, they, are, they, are not, they are not reprobate. And so, they can get saved, but their salvation is the same as us today. You know, what is it, the receiving of them? It's life from the dead. Well, isn't that what it is for us when we get saved? They get saved exactly the way we do. Is it hard to win them over? Absolutely. They're, they're a tough bunch. They're very, no, you know, nobody will question that. They're a tough bunch. But you know what? It's not impossible. They can, still, they can still be saved even though the time of the Jews was completed and the time of the, we are in the time of the Gentiles. Jews can still get saved today. And so look what it says in verse 16. For the first, first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. You know, don't get an idea that you're better than them, that God got rid of them so he could have you. You know, don't get that idea. You know, don't get this idea of replacement theology in the sense that, you know, God replaced Israel with a Gentile church. Listen, there's only, this is another subject for another day, but there's only one body. God is going to make, them all, make us all of one body. All those of faith are all of the same body. We all get to heaven by the same way, by grace, through faith. I'm sorry, that doesn't fit dispensational truth, but it fits, it fits the Bible. That's subject for another day. But at the same time, uh, you know, that's, that's what it's, you know, don't, don't get all high and mighty Gentiles, okay? You're, we're lucky we even got in the first place. And Jews can be saved just like us. Verse 20, it says, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded. But fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. All right? Don't get all high and mighty and think this is all about you because you're a Gentile. Don't make the same mistake the Jews did who said, we have Abraham as our father. Don't you say, well, I'm a Gentile. You know, that's dangerous thinking. It got them in a lot of trouble. And it'll get us in trouble too if we're the same way. Well, we're the Gentiles. Yeah, obviously we're saved. No, we know better than that. None of us in here are saved just because we're Gentiles or where our families are from. Nobody gets saved by that. But verse 22 says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in this goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. If they abide not still in unbelief, if they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be saved. Same way we got saved, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted in their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. All right? Folks, if you can get this, all right? I wish people would just even listen to me on this. Whenever I try to explain this to people, I get like three sentences in and then, all right? But you know what? This is preaching time. I get to talk. You don't get to interrupt. And so, I, and, and this feels good because I can't talk to people about this without them interrupting me. That's just kind of, that's kind of how they do it. I would, so for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, 
lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Folks, if you get this, people listening to me, if they would, if they would just hear me out on this, I, I wish I could just get people to hear me out. I really do. It would, it would be wonderful if they could do that. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Forget everything you've ever heard right now. Forget everything you've ever heard. And let's look at the scriptures. What does that mean? Blindness in part has happened to Israel. We saw back in verse 7, I believe it was, uh, where we mentioned uh, the blindness. Go back in my, in my notes. It says, yeah, it says the rest were blinded. Okay, the election had obtained it. The saved, those who believed, you know, they had, uh, you know, they had received what they were seeking for. They received righteousness by faith in Christ. But the rest, all the rest of the Jews who did not believe in Jesus Christ, they were blinded is the term it uses. That's, it's using that term because it was prophesied that that would happen to them. It was prophesied in Isaiah that they would go into a deep sleep. That was prophesied. But what Paul's trying to explain to these people, don't misunderstand, folks, that they are not with, unable to be saved. They can be saved right now. This isn't a future thing. Right now, this stuff has already been fulfilled. See, they are, it says blindness in part. They are not completely blind to where they could never see to be saved. Okay? It's only blindness in part. They are not, that, mean, that can mean a couple things too. One, they're not, all, they're not all blind. Some are saved. But at the same time too, they all could be saved. Okay, if they would believe on Christ. And there's a reason for that. There is a reason that all of them could be saved, that they are not cast away, they are not reprobate. Some are, some are saved now, and if they believe on Christ, they will all be saved now. Verse 26, and says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Right here, this proves it. Yep, that all Israel is going to be saved someday. One of these days, when Jesus Christ returns, they're all going to get saved. What does it say? All Israel shall be saved. Okay. But look at this. And this is this is clearly prophetic. No, it's not. Nothing has been prophetic yet. Everything he's been talking about has been in that present time. There have been future tense words used because he's been quoting Old Testament prophecies that when they were written were future tense. And right here when he says, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written... There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Paul is speaking in future tense because he's quoting prophetic phrases from the Old Testament. Okay, When a teacher teaches a high school class, they assume you've completed grade school. All right, they, you know, they, They're just going to assume that. Okay? When they're teaching algebra and things like that, or, you know, they're going to assume you know basic math okay and paul here he's giving new testament truths and he is assuming that these people understand old testament truths the problem that we have today is people they read these passages and they don't know what the old testament says and because they don't know what the old testament says they are missing the point of what paul is trying to say here and i'm going to show you i'm going to let's look at these scriptures okay because listen if you don't know the old testament that's not god's fault that's your fault Okay? When Paul is quoting the Old Testament and he's using Old Testament terminology, if you're sitting there and you're reading this and you don't know that, that's not God's fault. It's not Paul's fault. It's your fault for not studying the Scriptures. And so look, let's look at a few verses that they all would have been familiar with that maybe we're not so familiar with today. First off, Psalms 14 verse 7 says, Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. And there's many other verses like this, you know, that's calling out, you know, for the salvation of Israel. When is it going to come? When is that deliverer going to come? Isaiah 59. This is what Paul, this is a verse that Paul was directly referencing. He says, and the redeemer, Isaiah 59, 20, and the redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in, in thy mouth 
shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. And I wish I could go through Isaiah 59 and 60 with you tonight, but we do not have time for that. There's a lot of good, uh, deep stuff in there. But look at he, Paul has quoted these verses about godliness coming to Jacob. Okay? About a deliverer coming out of Zion. Is that right now, is this future or past? It's past, isn't it? Jesus Christ was that deliverer. Jesus Christ came and he turned, you know, he turned uh, ungodliness and transgression away from Jacob. How did he do that? He did that by paying for their sins when he died on the cross. It says in there, he says, this is my covenant with them. Paul referred to that there in verse um, 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Is he, is he speaking future tense right there? Yes, because he, cause he's quoting Isaiah, which was future. And Paul here, he's not quoting this saying this is still yet to come. He's just quoting Old Testament. This has already happened. Jesus Christ, when he came and he died on the cross and he paid for their sins, that it's, that's the only thing that will turn ungodliness away from Jacob or anybody. That's the only thing that can cleanse anyone from their sins. And so he says in there, and so all Israel shall be saved. What does that mean? When is, when is all Israel going to be saved? Well, here's the problem with that question. That question is not to be asked now. It was supposed to be asked back then. Not in Paul's day, but in, you know, in the Old Testament time, when will all Israel be saved? When does a person get saved? Well, actually, we find out the chapter before in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, now you all see this? So all Israel shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When did Israel get saved? Well, it was when they called in the name of the Lord. But wait a minute. Are we talking? Here's where people are going to argue, and here's where there's going to be a disagreement. Are we talking about the physical, earthly nation of Israel? Or are we talking about the spiritual nation of Israel? And I believe the Israel that, it's, that he's talking about here is the Israel he referred to two chapters before. To, in, in Romans chapter 9, who are verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children of but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. See, they didn't know about this in the Old Testament. This is revealed in the New Testament, okay? God revealed this in the New Testament that sure enough, while there was a physical nation of Israel, at the same time, we know there was a spiritual nation of Israel too that was not revealed during that time. We know that not everyone that was a Jew got saved and went to heaven. I don't think anybody would argue that many, 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 many of those Old Testament Jews went to hell. I don't think anybody would argue that. Okay? But which ones went to heaven? Those who were of faith. Like Abraham. Those ones, those that was the real Israel. Okay, God made eternal promises to Israel. Okay? God made eternal promises concerning land for Israel. But, and people are like, no, it's that land over there in Israel. It's that physical land that's over there today. Well, isn't this earth going to pass away one of these days? Isn't this world going to burn one of these days? How could that be an eternal covenant if that's not an eternal place? This world is not an eternal place. No place on this world is an eternal place. These are, God fulfilled those promises through spiritual things through the heavenly Jerusalem, things that weren't revealed in the Old Testament, but they are revealed to us now, but somehow people have forgotten about them and they've made a big deal about something that 
really isn't that big of a deal. You know, who really cares about that land over there? It's not even that great a land, a lot of it. You know, Israel never had every, all that God promised them. Does that mean God didn't keep his promise? No, because it turns out God did keep his promise. It, was just, it wasn't the way they thought, it, but it was what God intended. That, they're going to get that heavenly Jerusalem. They're going to get what God intended for them, maybe just not what we thought they were going to get. Okay, and so under and so look at verse. Um, I, I read all that. So we see here that you know the Israel that shall be saved are the real Israel, those who are of faith. All those who will call on Christ will be saved. All Israel shall be saved. All those of faith shall be saved. We are saved today. Why? Because we called on the name of the Lord. All those, whether we're Jew or Gentile, whatever we are, if we call on the Lord, we will be saved and all Israel shall be saved. Yes, he's using a future term, but that whole verse, he is quoting stuff from the Old Testament, stuff that they were looking for, but he's telling us not that it's going to come in the future. These things had happened. They had been fulfilled. And so, uh, verse 28. See, when Paul said all Israel shall be saved, he was pointing out the fact that just like the prophecies foretold that the Messiah would come and remove ungodliness from Jacob, sure enough, it had happened through Jesus Christ. He wasn't trying to say it was going to happen. He was saying it happened. Folks, this whole chapter he's been, you know, he's been saying at this present time, you know, right now, how could you people get this wrong? We're living this right now. Right now, I'm proof that God has a cast away. I'm saved. There's other Jews that are saved. Yeah, we can make a lot of accusations against Israel like Elijah did. Elijah, he made some harsh accusations against Israel. But God said, you know, they're not all bad. There's still those who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And you know what? They're not all bad right now. There are some that are saved right now. All present right now during his time. All Israel shall be saved. They, it, that's already been fulfilled. God had turned ungodliness away from Jacob by sending Jesus Christ to pay for their sins by being that new covenant with Israel. It says in Jeremiah chapter 31, you know, has, you know, has that happened yet? Well, it says in Jeremiah 31, 31, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay. We, 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 we did look at that passage, didn't we? So I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Okay? He didn't say I'm going to make a new covenant or a new testament for the Gentiles. He said I'm going to make it with the house of Israel. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people. That's referred to in Hebrews. And it says, and they shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall no, all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Y'all see that? He's talking future there, but you, we know that that day has already come. They, they, all those, you know, you know they're, they're not going to be saying, you know, this is future. They will know me then. We can know Christ today. Those who are saved, they know Christ. He lives within their heart. Luke 22, verse 19 says, And he took the bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Y'all see that? This is that new Testament. This is that new covenant that was promised. My blood is that new covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel. Jesus Christ. The new covenant, the new Testament was for the house of Israel. Therefore, how can we be saved unless we are of Israel? But God has made us of Israel. He broke down that middle wall partition. 
you know, you're not going to, it's, it's hard to see that in the Old Testament because many things weren't revealed to them. But we have the book of Ephesians. We have the book of Galatians. We know, we know all these things. We see how we're of Abraham and we are of Isaac. You know, we're the children of the promise. You know, we are the spiritual seed. It's not about the physical. Abraham had two sons. Okay, you know, one was that natural son, Ishmael. The other one was a promise, Isaac. I've preached all that before. But, but these, these things clearly have happened. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. All who are of faith will be saved. If you are of faith today, it's clear in the Bible you are of Israel. If you have called on the Lord for salvation, you are saved today. That's what that's talking about when it says all Israel shall be saved. And so, Romans 11 verse 28 says, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They are beloved for the fathers. Referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Deuteronomy 4.29. This is the next thing you have to get if you want to understand a lot in the New Testament that people are just dead wrong on says but if from thence thou shalt seek the lord thy god thou shalt find him if thou seek him with all thine heart with all thy soul when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee even in the latter days if thou turn to the lord thy god and shalt be obedient unto his voice for the lord thy god is merciful god he will not forsake thee neither destroy thee nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them Okay, notice God said, if you will call on him, even in the latter days, even in the latter days, God will save you. I do not believe this is referring to the tribulation. It can be referring to the tribulation because Paul here in Romans chapter 11 has said, you know, this is already happening. They are beloved for the father's sake because of the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They can still be saved today, exactly what Deuteronomy chapter 4 is talking about. God's saying, you know, hey, even if, he, if you read all of that, you know, he's talking, basically tells them they're going to turn from him. But God says, even if you'll call on me, even in the latter days, I will save you. And this is where people will say, no, nope, it's definitely the tribulation. This is a future event. And I've, I've showed you this before, but it, it needs to be repeated because people just don't understand this and we need to get this in our head. But the latter days are not the days necessarily right before the rapture. That's what people don't understand. And I'm going I'm to show you that. But Luke 11.30 says, For ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath been uh, first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. See, the fatal mistake that people make when reading this chapter it's not knowing the scriptures that Paul's referring to, causing them to see those prophecies as prophecies that need to be fulfilled instead of prophecies that are already fulfilled. Everything in Romans chapter 11 has been fulfilled. It's all happened, and we are still in the same time that Paul was in right there. It's still the same today. Jews can get saved today. They're not cast away. They're not reprobate. We're in the latter days, but God will save them. If, if they will call on him, blindness in part has happened to Israel. They are definitely blind in part. Okay. But another mistake that people make from reading this is the idea that the gospel came to the Gentiles because of the Jews rejection. Okay. Now this is, it's a, it's a misunderstanding of, you know, the, we've attached definitions once again that aren't accurate. See, many think God only went to the Gentiles because of the Jews' rejection. Okay? But it's clear in the Old Testament, God always had a plan to go to the Gentiles, didn't he? God always had a plan. We're not going to look at all the passages. Uh, we'll probably see some of them, but God always had a plan. But the, what that's talking about, when it talks about because of their rejection, uh, you know, the gospel you know, went to the Gentiles, what that's talking about is God used the Jews' rejection to cause the gospel to go to the Gentiles. 
There he, it, it, because if it weren't for the persecution from the Jews, they would have stayed in Jerusalem. What do most people want to do today when they start a church or pastors who are pastoring a church? They're not out there trying to turn the world upside down. What are they trying to do? They're trying to just keep their own little flock together and have, you know, let's get, let's get behind closed doors. Let's be real private about everything we do. Let's not anybody hear what we're preaching. You know, let's not be too aggressive out there soul winning or anything like that because, you know, we don't want to offend people. We don't want persecution. That's the new attitude today. And it's, it's just kind of a natural thing. Let's get comfortable with our own little group. And the thing is, if the Jews would have all accepted, they would have stayed they'd have been perfectly content staying in Jerusalem. But what did Jesus tell them right before he went to heaven? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But they didn't do that. Even after Pentecost, he told them to stay until the Holy Spirit came. But even after Pentecost, they didn't do that. But then the persecution came and then they got busy. Then they spread out. And because of the Jews' rejection, because of the persecution from the Jews, it forced the church to leave Jerusalem and the gospel went all over the world. And so it ended up being a blessing. That persecution or that rejection was a, was a blessing. God used that to get the gospel to us. Okay. But it, it was always God's intention for it to go to us. What should have happened is after the, after Pentecost, they should have scattered all over the world and preaching the gospel. They didn't do that persecution came and then then it happened and so that's what paul's talking about right there and so but yeah you know churches today they are you know they're hiding out they're just getting in their own comfortable areas and you know what it's just a matter of time and god's going to let persecution come again and then we're going to finally start accomplishing something again and uh we shouldn't be too worried about that but then finally i guess you could say the final other fatal mistake is misunderstanding what the time of the Gentiles or the last days are. He said blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. All right. And right there, what people do, they've attached definition on that. You know, the fullness of the Gentiles. We have a period of time where God's working with the Gentiles and then he's going to go back to the Jews. Okay. That's automatically what you are supposed to get when you read that passage, but people don't understand what the fullness of the Gentiles is, or they don't understand what the last days are. Joel 2.27 says, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right. Is this future or past for us? All right. Well, we know the part about the sun being dark and the moon turned to blood. We know that hasn't happened yet, but are we not in the time where whoever calls will be saved? Look at what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. We just read it. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whomsoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. So right here, Peter's saying, this is it, folks. We are in those days. This is what was prophesied that was going to come. The latter day events that were prophesied in Joel this is it. It started, I believe it started on the day of Pentecost, the last days. And I, I do believe, not like the dispensationalists, 
the Acts is a transitional book. Okay. Now, if you don't know what that means in the dispensational world, you know, they're transitioning through dispensations. All right. And there, there's a lot of ways they try to chop all that up. But I believe it's this simple. It's a transitional book. They were transitioning from the time of the Jews into the time of the Gentiles or the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay. We don't have time to go through all the book of Acts, but they were transitioning into that time of the Gentiles. And so for Acts 3.24 says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. These days, the days Peter was living in. This is something that was prophesied. This is something that they said was going to come. So what specifically are last days? Once again, most people consider those the days right before the coming of Christ or the day of the Lord. And the truth is, the day of the Lord, or the coming of Christ, does come during the latter days. Okay? But we've been in the latter days for 2,000 years, roughly. And yes, Jesus is going to come back during the latter days. But it's a long period of time, and I'll show you some scriptures that you know, prove it was going to be a long time. But we, when the Bible talks about last days, it's referring to the time when God's focus would go from physical Israel... And it would be going to the Gentiles, or you could say he was folk going from focusing on physical Israel to spiritual Israel. Okay? And that had all physical or spiritual Israel has always been around. It's those of faith. They've always been around. We're not new. Okay? We're, 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 not, we're not a new thing. We've been around a while. But premillennial premillennialists like us. You know, we many times make the mistake of using last day reverence as the point of the day of the Lord. Well, we're definitely in the last days, you know, Jesus, meaning Jesus has got to be about to come back real quick. Okay, but last days doesn't mean the focus isn't day of the Lord. It's no, it's that time of the Gentiles that was prophesied about. Preterists, the people who believed all the prophecies have already been fulfilled, they get all mixed up because they constantly prove you know, that Peter, Paul, and John believed that we were living in the last days. And they're right. Peter, Paul, and John did believe we were living in the last days. But that doesn't mean they believed that the day of the Lord was just about to happen. It means they believed we were in the time of the Gentiles. They saw it happen. In their lifetime, they saw the shift. They saw the transition and so, and, but the preterists do. No, they, they were in the last days then. Last days don't last 2,000 years. Well, yeah, they do. If you understand that this is the time of the Gentiles, okay? Our focus has always been on the day of the Lord of the rapture, okay? Because that, that's, that's the great moment for us, okay? But the latter days is the time when God would go to the Gentiles. And so when you realize the last days are not about the day of the Lord, but about the time of the Gentiles, you can start to understand why Jesus hasn't returned yet. See, the Old Testament prophets prophesied about the time of the Gentiles, but they didn't understand it. 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then jump down to verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation... He's talking to Gentiles here. The prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, of, thing, of which things angels desire to look into. Many of the prophecies, in I, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those were not for them uh, back in their days. It was for those Peter, Paul, John, those guys in their days. They wrote these things not understanding them. God hadn't revealed them. These things were written for us. We are seeing, we have seen the fulfillment. We are now in those last days. Those days prophesied when the gospel would come to you, you Gentiles. We should have seen it coming. It was all over in the Old Testament, but you know, God just hadn't revealed it to us yet. But sure enough, folks, we are in those, he, this is Peter talking, we are in those last days right now. It took them a while before them to 
fully realize what had happened. Okay? You know, during that time when you read through the book of Acts, it was clear they didn't know what was going on. They focused on the Jew in the beginning. Why? Because that's what God wants? No, it was just because they didn't realize yet. And God had to send that persecution and they just couldn't help but spread the gospel wherever they went. And all of a sudden they see these Gentiles getting saved. Well, what's going on? We thought this was for Israel. The new covenant was for Israel. But wait a minute. These people are getting filled with the Holy Ghost just like we are. What's going on? Let's go see what the Bible has to say. And all of a sudden, God opens up the Scriptures like, good night, folks. This was right in front of our face the whole time. This is exactly what the Bible said was going to happen. And we, sure enough, are in fact in the last days. Why? We know because the Gospel is going to the Gentiles. Okay? Not because of the signs that Jesus Christ is about to return to the clouds. No, they were in the time of the Gentiles. And so... You know, Old Testament, or, you know, the Old Testament uses sometimes the term last days or latter days. We looked at Deuteronomy chapter 4 where God said, you know, if you'll turn to me even in the latter days, what is that? Well, they didn't really know about them, but during the time of the Gentiles, folks. Why did God put that in there if they wouldn't understand it? Because God knew Paul would understand it when it got to that time when he would write about it in Romans chapter 11 and remind people that Jews can still be saved even though we are in the time of the Gentiles. They can still be saved. They're not cast away. And Deuteronomy 31.29 says, For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke Him to anger through the work of your hands." Use that term latter days. This is something you're going to do. It's going to happen. It was constantly prophesied that they were going to go bad, that they were going to get kicked out of the land, and God was going to bring them out, bring them back into the land, and then they were going to get kicked out again. These things were all pro prophesied over and over again, and it was prophesied that the day was coming when all Israel would be saved. They, in their minds, they probably thought this was a physical thing too. A physical thing that was going to happen where God was going to give us the earthly kingdom right then. But no, before God can give them any of those things, they've got to be of faith first. They've got to be saved. And we all, it's, it's, it's crazy how focused preachers get on a physical kingdom when we know this world is nothing. You know, it, it's all, it's about, you know, heaven, about the new heaven and the new earth. And so there's a lot of mixed up stuff there. But, uh, 2 Timothy 3 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. You know, we see that the last days, the last times, and sure enough, you know, they're talking about it. We know this is coming, and we see as they write that sure enough, we're in it. It's, it's mentioned over and over. We don't have time to look at all the last days references. But look at 1 John chapter 2. You need to look at this one. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, Little children, it is the last time. Sure enough, we're here. We're in it, folks. This is what John's saying. And ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Antichrist comes during the latter days. Okay? It's going to be towards the end of the latter days. But he says, uh, and even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they would have been of us, they no doubt would, uh, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they are not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know the truth, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is a Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Well, let me ask you, who are these people that says they went out from us because they were not of us? We always use that whenever people leave our church, right? And I'll tell you why they went out from us. Because they were not of us, all right? You know, and you know, that's, that's probably some truth to that too. But what is John actually talking about here when it says they went out from us? It can only be a reference to the Jews. The Jews were the ones who believed in another Christ. They were the ones that believed in another Christ. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is a Christ. It was the Jews that were looking for a Messiah, that were looking for a Christ, and that said it wasn't Jesus. He's talking about the Jews, and the Bible says it went out, they, they did that so it would be manifest, so it would be revealed that they were not all of us. Okay? The physical seed is not necessarily Israel, it fits with all the rest of the Bible. And so that's what he's talking about. And he said, 
It's last time, folks. Why did he he mentions that at the beginning? Why? Because this is the last time. We know this because God's working with the Gentiles now, and they they went out from us because they, they weren't they weren't of us, and so we don't have time to go into all the scriptures that show that you know the last days was going to be a long period of time, but it does say in. Uh, I'll read 2 Timothy 3 1. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then if you look down in verse 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know, it's telling you, hey, things are just going to get worse and worse. Hey, we've still got a ways to go. There's still time. They didn't know how much time it was. But Second Peter, you know, uh, he talked about it in verse three. That in the last days, scoffers are going to come walking after their own lust, saying, "Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation." He said, "Hey, there's going to be a day coming where people are going to come along and be like." Doesn't look like he's coming back. It's been a long time. The fathers have fell asleep. Everybody who wrote about this, they're all gone. They're all dead and gone. Where is he? He's not coming back. Said it was prophesied that it was it was it was going to be a while, but it never said how long. And I'm not even going to try to set a date on it. That would be foolish. I'm just going to make myself look like an idiot if I do that. But when is our time up? When is the time of the Gentiles over? Well, that's for, I'm glad you asked me that because it says in Romans 11.25, we looked at that. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, the fullness or the completion. When does the time of the Gentiles end? Well, Luke 21.23 says, but woe. Unto them that are with child, unto them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay? Right there, Jerusalem's going to be trodden down until that time is fulfilled, and that time is fulfilled in Revelation chapter 11. We don't have time to read it, but it's going to be fulfilled. Three and a half years into the tribulation. That's when the time of the Gentiles is comes to an end. Halfway through Daniel's 70th week, it's spelled out right there. So right there, you know, it doesn't it doesn't end it, it ends at the rapture, but notice it ends halfway through the tribulation, roughly. Alright? Or halfway through Daniel's 70th week. Sorry about that. It's after the tribulation. Let me get my facts straight. But fullness, it often refers to a completeness of time. A finishing. Galatians 4.1 Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, deferreth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage in the other months of the world. But when the fullness of time was come... God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. When did Jesus Christ come? He came in the fullness of time. In the completion of time. Well, what time? Well, the time of the Jews. During that time, Jesus Christ finished it. Jesus Christ finished. He completed the Old Testament. At the death of the testator, we see that in Hebrews. Jesus Christ finished that. And that was the end of that time. And just kind of a side note, you know, the time from, I believe it started with Abraham to Christ is roughly 2,000 years. If God gave the Jews 2,000 years, roughly, it made sense that we've been here about 2,000 years. God's given us the same amount of time. So, you know, whenever you read a passage referring to the last days, you should think of it as the time of the Gentiles. The time that was prophesied over and over again in the Old Testament. Not that necessarily the time right before the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is going to come at the end of the time of the Gentiles, but you know it would, you know, at the same time, and, and I say it sometimes too. You know, I'll see stuff going on like, "Wow, we're definitely living in the last days." Well, duh, we've been in it for two thousand years. Okay, you know what I mean when I'm saying that. What other people mean, what they mean is, "Wow, look at what's going on. Jesus must be about to come, become soon." And we do, we say that wrong. 
But that is what the time of the Gentiles or the fullness of the Gentiles is. And so I hope you got Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 has all been fulfilled. Every bit of it. Jews can be saved. It's hard, blindness in part, but they can be saved. And we've got, we've got to get this right. Too many people are going around worshiping Jews and telling them they're great and wonderful. And, you know, they've got another covenant. No, listen, there's the Old Testament or Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And we've got some people out there that think there's another covenant coming for Israel again. No, I don't believe in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the New New Testament. All right. Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament didn't save anybody. But the New Testament, it saved everybody. Those who are of faith in the Old Testament and those of faith from here on out. And thank God for that. So with that, let's all stand together.